Eh, buenas tardes, es un placer para mí estar con ustedes, eh, pero me disculpe que voy a hablar inglés, que es más fácil, eh, porque si pruebo a hablar en portuñol, probablemente voy a cometer muchos errores y cambio un poco, me disculpe. Um, I will try to do my best in, in English. I think it will be easier for me. Maybe not for you, I'm sorry. Um, this is not the first time that I've been to Uruguay. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here. So um, I hope we could learn from each other from the experience that we'll share. It's not my own experience. It's an experience that I share from my works, uh, f from different parts of my life and also from different groups, um, teams that we have been working in Brazil. So this is a little bit uh, of what I'm going to say, a few things about the University of Sao Paulo, how we are working on circular economy as part of also as a pioneer university from Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, some of the challenges that we're facing, very similar to Uruguay, al although we are a little bit bigger, as you know, uh, uh, in terms of size of the country, economy, but there are a lot of things that we could do together and learn from each other and, and design our own, I would say, journey together. A journey from Latin America, a journey that we could uh, hold hands together and do something together and write our own stories. So, but I will share with you some stories from Brazil, the stories that we have been working with, not uh, s stories from Europe, but stories from here that we could share. Now, this is the thing, w w this is the uh, interesting chart that says inequity or inequality is unsolved. So, uh, you see that the, um, the line in red is the number of the 62 richer people in the world, which represents 50% of the uh, wealth of the world. So it's, it's widening the gap. This is not different in Brazil. So this is an outskirt of a favela in Brazil with a very fancy neighborhood. We cannot live in a situation like that because we are just widening the gap. So we need to also to tackle some of these issues of um, this wide gap that is widening and widening. So at the University of Sao Paulo, we are working on, uh, as part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, to create a platform that we could help from the foundations or from the different, let's say, schools of thoughts. As, as you know, we are in a journey. We are learning uh, from experience. We are learning from the different schools of thought that comprehend the, the, the theme around circular economy. This is why we have so many questions, because probably I, what is my entry point? It is industrial ecology or symbiosis, uh, it is um, life cycle analysis, it is um, material flows, system dynamics. So we are combining these different lines of thoughts around circular economy. So, and we are designing our own framework, and this is the framework that we are working in Brazil. So, in the center is the system, the, the vision of a system. I think we are sharing this all together. Oh, several of the speakers previously here were saying, well, we have to look at the system. This is what we have to look and, and how we are complementing with different solutions that will be specific maybe to Uruguay, to a specific sector, or to Brazil, or to Argentina, to Peru, Colombia. So this is some of the examples that I will share with you. They, uh, the organizers asked me to be very specific on the cases. So I will start one with uh, one case from the Amazon, from one particular um, uh, tr uh, tree or palm tree, very well known, probably that you know, is acai, is a super berry, it's a like, very dark berry. So we have been working in the Amazon with the acai project. Um, several projects in agriculture, uh, because probably we have a lot of in common uh, in terms of agriculture. Uh, textile, uh, one project in paper, uh, one project with the National Confederation of the Industries. Uh, I'm not sure if you have the same organization, but this organization encompasses all the industry in Brazil. And, and finally, a uh, um, program to accelerate the accelerators. So, and I will share with you what does that mean by that. So as you know, everybody was saying, we need to think on what is going to be the next steps. Uh, our colleague from Vahining said, and the other one said, we need to feed the world, but what type of food do we have, and how are we going to be producing the necessary food and quality? How many of you, for example, have you been to a farm? Can you raise your hands? 
Good. How many of you are farmers? One or two. Do you think it's easy to produce food? No? But we're expecting food to be cheap, right? To provide environmental services, to set aside land for nature, to do things for, uh, let's see, for the environment, to conserve pollinators, to do everything. So we're expecting a lot from the, from the farmers, right? Are we expecting the same from the oil companies to do the same? No, but we're demanding that the farmers deliver everything, right? So cheap, organic, volume, quality, safe, everything. So it's a, it's a daunting task for farmers to do this all together. And we're expecting too much. And, and uh, are we willing to pay when we have uh, some problems in the agriculture to pay a little bit more? And how are we going to be producing food if we don't have water, and if we have uh, climate change, and if we have uh, instability of prices, and we have a uh, shortage of several of the fundamentals? So it's not simple. So what I'm going to do in this case is to illustrate, uh, I will use um, some of the building blocks the foundation is using, which is, I will explain this briefly. So, and, and previously, um, I think some of you already share. So I use the building blocks of circular economy, starting from design for circularity, business models, reverse cycles, and then the enabling conditions. Enabling conditions could be policies, could be technical enabling conditions, could be something that supports uh, the transition, okay? So in each example, I will re-emphasize what are the specifics of each of these building blocks that we are working towards helping or towards uh, supporting the cases. So I will use this as a framework to analyze or to help or to transform the examples that I'm sharing with you. It's okay? So this is the acai. Acai is a typical palm tree that occurs along riparian corridors. Riparian corridors is where the river uh, streams so we have a very fragile ecosystem because this is where the entry point towards deforestation. So on the, on the other hand, acai is the substance of keeping the nutrient flows in the biological cycles. So acai is dispersed by fish, it's dispersed by birds, dispersed by humans. So acai is essential to the conservation of these riparian forests. It is essential for local communities because 95% of the total acai produced is coming from extractive uh, practice. So, in all the acai that we see in Europe, in California, Florida, Brazil, they're coming from natives or local communities that are rely uh, of their incomes based on this palm tree. But these guys are totally, I would say, away from the market. Sometimes one guy that is living in near a river, it takes two days for the guy to deliver the acai towards a market or towards a third, a, a third guy to a fourth. Or it's a long and very incomplete value chain. So we are designing uh, solutions and help these guys to communicate directly with the buyer. So through an app and, and tracing the acai from that. So, because we have multiple products uh, and we have a huge demand on, on adding value to acai, so it's not only the pulp of the acai, frozen acai, which is very cheap, so we have to transform that into something that is much more valuable and the value should stay with the ones or should be transformed into something, into quality of life of those that are living nearby. So this is the type of cycles that are, we are working also there. So we are trying to, for example, integrate the production and increase what we call through um, restoration projects of acai plantations, managing better, uh, use all the co-products, using the oil that no one is using. Anyway, using the system as a much more integrated way rather than just managing one palm tree, but managing the system. The other example that I will share with you now, it's about agriculture. 
I will give you more examples and more details about these cases if you want. I could send you each uh, specific case in details. So just bear in mind with me that it will be a, a quick journey through these cases. But the, the data and information is available. So now um, we are very much looking at solutions that will be managing complex landscapes. Because when we talk about agriculture, we're talking about environmental services, we're talking about managing water, managing the soils, produce fiber, produce food, produce bioenergy, as the biovalor is about, right? So we have to add value to the landscape. And we're not managing a crop, we're managing a landscape. I tell my students, agronomists mainly, to say, you're not an agronomist, you're managing the landscape because you're making, or you're making decisions about what you're going to be planting, or why you're planting, or why you're deforestating, why you're doing that. So farmers and, and agriculturists and agronomists and foresters are managing are managers of landscapes. We have to see a landscape as your asset. So, and how can we do this? How can you integrate value chains? How can we convert that into a product as a service? Uh, can we have industrial symbiosis? This is what BioValor is about. It's putting together the pieces that are isolated. So can we have a complex landscape like that? This is beautiful when we see this in, in Tuscany or in France. But move to the Amazon. Move to an isolated place in Uruguay. It's easy to say that because farmers in Europe receives a lot of subsidies. It's easy for me. <laughs> it's easy. Uh, for me to say back in, in, in Brussels, because those guys are, are fighting for keeping their subsidies in, in place. But what about the small farmers, those guys that do not have uh, access to market, those guys that do not have technology, those guys do not uh, know or uh, do not have access to technologies that could improve their ways of, of producing. So the challenges uh, for Brazil, for example, is huge. Um, this is the number, the recent numbers of agriculture in Brazil. We have 34 million hectares of soybean. <coughs> Do you know how much, uh, uh, what is the area of pasture land in Uruguay? You should know, BioValor should know, because it gives you the, the perspective of the potential of producing manure or producing cattle. What is the area uh, of uh, pasture land in Uruguay? Number of heads, number of heads of cows. 12 million, 12 million. Brazil, we have 200 million, 200 million. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that it's good for me, just saying it's a challenge. It's a challenge for me, which is good, right? So we have 200 million heads of cows that we need to see how many biovalor projects we could have there, right? So sugarcane, we have 10 million hectares. So just to give an idea about the size of the uh, agribusiness economy in Brazil. Forestry, mainly eucalypts, as you're having here also a couple of uh, large projects. We have uh, about 9 million hectares of eucalypts. But look at the area of pasture land in Brazil, 170 million hectares, which is almost three times the size of annual crops. So we have huge opportunity to do something and integrate that. So this is an example, the photograph is an example of integrating what the guy from Wageningen said in theory, we're doing in practice. Integration of pasture land with production of fiber and cattle. So we need to provide these numbers because if, if it doesn't make sense in economic terms, circular economy will not have any impact to transform agriculture. So we need in agriculture, and farmers are risk averse. No one likes innovation truly, right? <laughs> because innovation poses challenges. We think that we love innovation, but when you go to the market, people are risk averse, right? And, and, right? It's easy to say for Google, it's easy to say for a large player that they w would like to innovate. But go to a small and mid-sized enterprises that do not have the cash flow to pay uh, the employees are to play, pay their debts. It's hard when you think about small-scale enterprises. So, and this is another example that we are combining the production of fiber with wheat, which is managing uh, this, this landscape in a much more, I would say, smart way. 
So I will give you three examples because the solution for managing complex landscapes does not come with, from a single lens. We have to combine multiple options, several options altogether. It's easy to say that we need to save water, that we need to uh, fix uh, the issue of nitrogen leakaging. It's easy to say, harder to implement. So to implement, it is a combination of multiple actions together in a system. So the next slides, I will share examples that are not the panacea, but they complement each other. So one, is, one example is how to reduce the use of agrochemicals, especially insecticides. The other one is about increasing lifespan of parts in machines. And the other one is providing the right incentives for innovation. Three examples that are combined that probably will be pieces of this puzzle. So the first one is how can we use uh, drones to deliver biological agents in the field? Instead of, uh, because one of the problems of using biological control agents, replacing uh, insecticides, is about the scale. Because when you think about scale in Brazil, and you see a farm that is 1,000 hectares, or 2,000 hectares, how can you cover distributing biological agents? How many of you are aware of biological agents in soybean? How many of you heard uh, of any company that is uh, deploying biological agents in Uruguay to substitute insecticides, for example? But in Brazil, Brazil is, has a position of being the leader in the deployment of biological agents especially macro-biological agents, which are small insects. And then we have uh, micro-biological agents as well. But this is the use of vents to deliver. First, we need to, to have the intelligence. The circular economy is about understanding the problems, understanding and having the insights. Without understanding the system, you cannot say that you are circular, because you need to understand this in a much more integrated way. So this is one of the solutions. It's not a, a solution based on a company, because this company has several other, I would say, enterprises together. A company that designed the device for these agents, for these small insects. So there is one company that designed the device to precisely drop the number of uh, um, agents per area. Another company that is designing um, or that is producing the biological agents. Another company that's providing the ground truthing for that, and then the drone. But this company, as you saw just in before, look at the chart on the middle. The, this is affecting the design of the system or the design of the, the service. It is affecting the business model and is providing the enabling conditions not into the reverse cycle. This is more applicable to the three building blocks. What do I mean by that? There, the initial idea was to sell drones. Now they're selling service. Service paid by actor that they're coveraging. So we're switching their business model to sell the service. Now I will give you an example about another company from a value chain that you are very much aware. Um, sorry. So this is the value chain of sugarcane in Brazil, because we are also using the value chain approach to understand it as a system. Uh, in, within the system that is providing ethanol, sugar, bioenergy, bioplastics, uh, biochemicals, uh, carbon credits, uh, sugar is already, sugarcane is already producing around 30% of total Brazilian energy, already. Um, but in addition, the, the entire system now, because of a policy that prohibits burning sugarcane in Brazil, there was a policy that prohibited sugarcane in Brazil uh, 15 years ago. So the policy said by um, 2015, all sugarcane should be mechanically harvested by these machines. These machines cost around $1 million each. So very expensive machines. But the most fragile parts of these machines are the knives, 
that cuts sugarcane. Instead of cutting sugarcane with the hand, with the large, uh, I don't know the name, um, facão, como se disse? In his, huh? O machete. Instead of cutting with the machete, we need to cut with, uh, with these machines, which cost a million dollars, but each knife of these machines, if it is damaged, costs only five dollars. So the fragile part of this machine are the knives. What these guys are doing is uh, it's a startup that is, has been focused on the, a process, what we call laser cladding. Laser cladding is the deposition of a mineral powder through lasers, very potent lasers, to design new metals or to produce uh, um, a metal that is much more res resistant. But these guys were thinking about selling knives to these machines, to these companies. What they did in initially, they were looking at increasing lifespan and also reduce operational cost of these machines that uh, when these knives broke, these machines that cost a fortune, they have to be replaced or repaired. So what the solution is, they are designing not only the blades, but the platform. So they are renting the platforms as a service, not selling the knives. So they redesign and they are shaping new knives and producing knives that last longer. So instead of selling, they're renting also. So this is why they're, um, and they're having control, totally control of the uh, reverse logistics. So the owners of the knives are the ones that are renting so the knives that are broken returns to the company that could reshape the knives or if the knives are totally damaged will be going back into to, to make a mineral powder so it's a very interesting example and these guys are changing totally the the playing field um, and this is why it is um, it is encompasses all the four options uh, but they struggle because the legislation in Brazil did not allow them to, to sell, as a, to rent these species. So they, are, they have to overcome this so to, to make it viable. Um, and the last, the last example from agriculture is a new example that probably you should think about the same here in Uruguay, which is called Agricultura de Baixo Carbono which is very similar to, to what you th you're thinking. But this is a special program that has very low interest rates for farmers that would like to, to get some uh, incentives for that. So that implies that you need to integrate. So the basics is not monocropping. It is the integration, which is the, which is the fundamentals of this program. So you need to integrate cattle ranching, fiber, um, crops, so it's not only, it's not about agroforestry, but how you're integrating that, so, and in multiple combinations. So that um, has low interest rate, has a fast track in analysis of credit, and, and implies integration of annual crops, long-term crops, with pasture land. So this is called Agricultura ABC. This is very, uh, I'm not sure if you have the similar program here. Um, this is part of our milestones from Paris Agreement as well. Um, and finally, I think uh, to manage landscapes properly in the agriculture, we need to have a, a very well-defined system of zoning, which is what we're going to do, how we're going to be managing the landscape, uh, the water protection, and, and, and therefore this we could think on, on, on moving from the bio valor, from having landscapes like that to landscapes that are much more sustainable and then we could combine even soybeans with eucalypts and other species and, and managing this in a much more systemic way, in a much more circular way. And finally, uh, another example that we're working is from textiles. We're working with a very large retail company that does not own any factory for textiles, but they are concerned about their impacts. So the pillars are, are based on, on three elements. Innovation um, in raw materials, new fibers, recyclable fibers. Innovation in the process of making those. Innovation in the design of clothes. So we, so we are very much integrated from the thinking of the clothes, from cradle to cradle, from the designers of clothes, 
that with those guys that are producing the clothes and also taking all the scrap from the clothes, as you said there, the retalhos, as we say in Portuguese. Um, do you have an idea for one kilo of tissue, of fabric, how much of that is actually lost w to make a t-shirt? If a t-shirt wears one kilo, how much actually is transformed into a t-shirt? How much uh, of the raw material that enters into a, f uh, into a fabric, uh, into a, a plant? Do you have an idea? How much is lost in just this, just this, uh, why is the pointer here? Doesn't work? So this is when you have um, tecidos planos, que ustedes llaman, see? So the flat tissue. If it enters in the process of cutting, this, this amount here is what it is left. And then you have to defiber and to make another fiber and to make clothes. Just this piece here, we are losing around 30% just on that. So we cannot afford, and this is generates a lot of uh, residues, which are not residues, which are assets. Assets for industries that are not well developed, because those guys that are defibring or producing this, they have very low technology. And the value chain is totally fragmented, because it's very manual intensively. The, the guy needs to collect from one plant to another one to another one. It's totally mixed together, the residues, so there's no value. So the company that is producing, not selling the t-shirt, because the company doesn't produce a t-shirt, the retail company doesn't produce a t-shirt. And in fact, today, uh, this company is launching the first store here in, in Montevideo, which is Grupo Henner. So I'm, I'm working with Grupo Henner. This is a project with Grupo Henner. They don't advertise this yet. But you'll hear this probably in the next two months that the CEO will advertise this program. So the Grupo Henner doesn't produce uh, one single t-shirt, but they are concerned about their impacts, which is very genuine. And, and we have been, uh, we'll be, it, this is a three-year project. So very interesting project. But the first thing that we had to convince was the designer of clothes that they could be using recyclable fibers. They are not as soft, that is not as uh, perfect, as a virgin fiber. So we changed the mindset also of the designers. So that needs to be very systemic within the, the, the company. And then finally, uh, a product that also has an implication with Uruguay. We are working with unbleached paper, a paper that is not bleached. Uh, a paper is very specific that has very little, I would say, impact uh, based on, on, on the life cycle uh, analysis uh, and beyond the life cycle, uh, a, a typical bleach paper, um, which is um, a, a bleach paper which is dark green, uses more trees, uses more energy, uh, emit much more sulfur dioxide, um, more greenhouse gases, more nitrogen oxide, uses more water and produces more waste. So why are we are bleaching paper for things that doesn't need to be bleached, okay? Why are we, we need to bleach things if we are wanted recyclable paper that is not white? Why do we have a white paper? So we need to be thinking on why white? And so, and this is a startup from some of our students that we're supporting. So all examples. And finally, um, uh, well, we have one more. So this is the uh, uh, process of converting the mindsets of the industry. We're hired, we were hired as University of Sao Paulo by the National Confederation of the Industry, by these players, to think on the Brazilian case towards the transition uh, or around circular economy issues. But to do that, they need to be aware, they need to be educated. So we have been running a lot of workshops, a lot of uh, uh, projects with them. This is a workshop that we, we run uh, last Friday that can also attend it. So we need to provide to the industry to show that there is a value around circular economy concepts 
If they don't understand what circular economy is about, how come they, these guys from the industry in Brazil would embrace that? So we need to engage them on capacity building, awareness, and show real cases. Um, and to show real cases, this is a real case that we are supporting and we are thinking, which is the creation of an ecosystem of innovation based on a very, would say, um, truly circular economy principles. This is a very old sugar mill, abandoned sugar mill. This one is a huge area. So this area uh, was transformed into uh, what we call the innovation uh, mill. Uh, and the process is to create a circular acceleration process of the accelerator that is there. So, and we are disseminating uh, circular economy principles towards the companies, the startups, that are under the process of acceleration. So instead of us uh, reaching every single startup, which is the powerhouse of the innovation, the powerhouse of SMEs, we are working with the accelerators to add into their guidelines for acceleration the circular economy principles. So we gain much more scale and traction. So this is a nice place to visit. I, I welcome you to visit the site. We have around already established 20 companies. We have some anchors, big companies there as well. So, and this is a part of the team. This is not my effort. It is a team effort. It is our effort together. So if we are truly circular, it has to be a team effort. It should be much more collaborative way. So I hope we could join forces with you guys in Uruguay and other places and, 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 and learn from each other from our experience. Thank you very much.